Rabbi, before we talk about the horrors of what unfolded on October the 7th, just recap, if you will, what happened to your family in April of, of this year. So, uh, David, we were uh, driving up to a holiday in uh, next to the Sea of Galilee in Tiberias, and uh, we had just actually bought a second car uh, and got rid of a larger car, which would have taken all seven of us. And so we were driving up in two groups. My wife was with uh, my daughters, Maya and Rina. I was with uh, Tully and Yehuda. And my uh, fifth child, uh, Karen, was uh, staying in, in Jerusalem for the weekend. They're going to join us later. Um, as we were driving up, uh, we got a message from my sister, who was in the third car, an hour behind us both. And um, she said there'd been a, a terror attack on the road. Were we OK? So I said, we were fine. And then I called Lucy immediately to find out how she was. I knew that she was we were neck and neck really on the journey, although she took a slightly different route at one point. Uh, and she didn't answer. So I called Maya and she didn't answer. I called Rena and she didn't answer. And then I looked on the Google family link and I saw they were exactly at the location where this attack had occurred. So, of course, I immediately turned around. Uh, I started driving back down the, the road to, to that location. Uh, at the same time, my son, who is 14, uh, has access to a website um, in Israel that uh, gives the first information about any terror attack. And there was a photograph of a car, white car with bullet holes in it. And on the back seat, you could clearly see the beach bag that they were taking up. And it was clearly our beach bag. So it was covered in blood. So clearly we were in shock, but we drove down there. Uh, they wouldn't let us get close to the scene because they told us, the psychologists, that it would be too traumatic. We sat there for probably what probably felt like an hour, might have been, I don't know, for half an hour. Um, and I was begging them to go to see, to be able to identify, to check that it was them because I couldn't believe it. And eventually they brought me the ID card of my daughter, Maya, and we knew that the worst had happened. They'd also told us that the, 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 the woman who was driving had been airlifted to um, Jerusalem, to the hospital. So we immediately did a new turn uh, and drove straight down to uh, Jerusalem. Um, we sat by our bed for the next couple of days. Um, and sadly, Lucy uh, passed away as well. And so we ended up having uh, two uh, funerals, the first one for my two daughters and the second one for my wife a couple of days later. And um, that was uh, really, you know, that, that was uh, a, a terrible disaster for us and uh, tragedy. And, and the, the terrorists uh, apparently were uh, two Hamas terrorists funded by Iran um, who intercepted their car and shot them at close range with a Kalashnikov and 20 bullets. And my wife took one in her brainstem, one in her upper spine. And despite the operation, they weren't able to save her. In the immediate aftermath of what happened, you were coping with trying to look after your your family, but also with the attention of, of the world's media covering every second uh, uh, of the of the story uh, uh, as it developed how did you manage to navigate your grief and that situation with the eyes of the world upon you i found uh something uh strange which i didn't expect which was that the more that i was engaged in uh new sort of meaningful activities uh the more I was able to achieve and the, the more that I was just sort of sitting there in my own grief thinking about uh, what I'd lost, uh, the less I was able to achieve. And uh, for some reason, people were approaching me. Uh, we, we had 10,000 people at the funeral. We had probably a similar number who came to the Shiva, which is seven days of mourning. Um, and after the, the, the seven days were finished, people contacted me by WhatsApp, you know, incessantly asking me to speak here and to speak there and to do this and do that. And I decided to take them up. And what I found was the busier I was, the less uh, I was able to sort of sit in my grief and 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 uh, and, ju and just fall into depression. So uh, and and as I did more, I wanted to do more, and and that's really what powered me through the the, the period. And and my kids as well. Thank God they they all started. It was the end of the school year. They all started new activities this year, and now they're surrounded by friends and new activities and so forth. And the more that they're doing new things and stretching themselves. Uh, the more they're able to deal with, uh, with with the tragedy that we we uh, underwent. How conscious were you as a British Israeli that you had a role to play in terms of how the world 
interprets what had happened? I, I think that we got a lot of attention from the media at the time. And I think that the reason was uh, that three things uh, came together. Number one, um, it was three people who were killed in one attack. And that's quite, even in Israel at the time, it was very unusual for three people to be atta- uh, killed in one attack. So that was, uh, you know, one person is a personal tragedy, two is, uh, you know, um, a family tragedy or local tragedy, three becomes, you know, almost a calamity on a national, international scale. Uh, the second factor was that there were three ladies and they're beautiful ladies and uh, clearly harmless uh, ladies. And I think that was a second fact. And the third thing, as you say, they were British um, as well. Um, so that made it more of an international uh, story and an international event. And so therefore, I was very conscious that this was um, a tragedy on an international scale. And uh, yep, it very quickly got picked up by the world media. And you must have been conscious simply by living uh, as an Israeli and living in the world where anti-Semitism is, is, is rife, that there was the potential for what happened to your family to be labelled in a way that wouldn't be described as terrorism. So how did the British government respond initially and how did that change over time? So the initial response from the Foreign Office was predictable in its uh, blandness and inaccuracy um, they said that three British Israeli uh, women had been killed, and um, the Foreign Office calls for a uh, retraction of, you know, of, of terror of, of uh, violence on all sides. Um, Melanie Phillips uh, wrote an article immediately where she said this is inaccurate in many ways. She said, and it's, it's appalling in many ways. Number one, they weren't killed; they were brutally murdered. Number two, it refers to them only as British Israelis, as if, you know, it's not enough that they were just uh, British or just Israelis. And number three, um, calling for a de-escalation on all sides, presumably including the three dead women. Um, So I thought that was a a very powerful way of expressing uh, the disgust of that particular announcement. So I then approached um, James Cleverly um, and said, uh, you know, this through the ambassador, I said, you know, what we really need here is a statement, uh, which is a little bit more uh, accurate. Um, and the next day, uh, to his great credit, and, and James Cleverly is really, uh, I, 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 we, we would call him as Jews, we call him a mensch, which means like a sort of, you know, as a righteous individual. I don't know what the correct English would be for that. Um, an upstanding, upstanding uh, individual. Um, he wrote uh, a most incredible uh, uh, announcement that the British government uh, condemns terror. Um, the terrorist is never right. The victim is never wrong. And uh, you know, this was a heinous crime against humanity and uh, and so forth. And so so I think that James Cleverly set the stage for the world, uh, really for world uh, leaders um, to understand that terror is always wrong, even against Jews, even in Israel. And um, by by saying that, he really took a, a leadership role in, in in the stand against world terror. And I understand that one of Lucy's organs would save the life of a Palestinian. Just tell us about that. Actually, it was an Arab Israeli um, living up in uh, the north of Israel in an uh, Arab Israeli uh, town. Um, her organ saved five lives, and um, by Israeli law. Uh, they are not allowed to, you know, allowed to specify uh, Jewish or Muslim. So the organs go uh, proportionally. There are twenty percent of the population are Muslim. So therefore, one uh, went to a uh, Muslim, and uh, I went up to visit him, uh, and we had a very emotional exchange. I gave him a gift, and he gave me a gift. I invited me to sit and have coffee and meet his uh, newborn uh, baby daughter, who he told me that had he not had the transplant when he had it. He would never have met because his wife had it while he was in hospital having the transplant, um, and he was very ill at the time. So uh, it was very emotional and uh, yeah, very uh, life affirming. And how would your wife have felt about that? So Lucy was very much into uh, can, yeah, having better connections with our Palestinian neighbours. Uh, she actually sent my daughter Maya uh, and uh, my daughter Tali to a. Um, joint summer camp between what you'd call settlers and Palestinians, uh, which was in Area C, which is our mutual area near our supermarket. And they spent a week. Maya was a camp counselor. Tali was an attendee. 
Uh, they spoke mostly in English to the Palestinian kids, and it was a very positive experience for everybody. And I think my daughter Karen also went to a photography uh, activity uh, for a few weeks with Palestinian kids, also in the same uh, location. So she was very, very much uh, for uh, peace activities with our, our neighbors. And, um, you know, as, as usual, the terrorists don't differentiate between those who want peace and those who don't. But in fact, the truth is they probably hate the people who want peace more than the people who want to fight because um, they're not interested in peace. They're actually only interested in, uh, in, in conflict. I can't imagine how difficult the last few months have been. But I imagine that on October the 7th, your emotions went through the rigor Tell us exactly how you heard the news of what happened and what you felt as the horrors unfolded. So, uh, David, uh, you know, it took place on Shabbat, but it was also a Jewish festival, which is called Simchat uh, Torah. Um, and the strange thing about Simchat Torah is that what we do on Simchat Torah is we finish every week in, in synagogue, we read a little part of the five books of Moses. But on Simchat Torah, we finish the end of it, the last bit of Deuteronomy, and then we start again from the beginning of um, Genesis. And so I had been to the service. We literally just finished reading the first bit of Genesis about the creation. And then the siren went off uh, and men, women, and children and elderly were all you know, running uh, to the uh, shelter. We get about a minute and a half uh, because of the distance we are from Gaza. Um, so uh, we all hid in the shelter. Then once it stopped, we heard some, you know, a number of bangs. We went outside. We saw uh, the missiles had been sent, uh, the, thank God, had been exploded by the uh, Iron Dome system. Um, and then we went back into synagogue. Um, and then uh, we came back. Uh, then we went home later when it finished. Uh, there were two more sirens. Uh, we have neighbors upstairs. So they basically joined us in our safe room because we share the same safe room. So we were uh, uh, four, four of us and a uh, family of five uh, from upstairs who were uh, with small kids, all, all in one small room, my daughter's bedroom, which is the safe room. Um, and uh, that's how we spent uh, the rest of the day. Then, of course, we, we didn't have a huge amount of information available to us because being the Sabbath and a festival, we didn't have our telephones at the ready. Um, but what we did know was that our friends, you know, friends of our sons and, and friends would be called up and there were cars coming to pick them up to take them to the battlefronts. Um, so we had some information about that. Then there was some mention about, um, about hostages being taken, but the whole thing was so surreal um, it didn't make any sense to us whatsoever. We thought, you know, surely Israel has the safest border with uh, Gaza. We have security, we have soldiers, we have intelligence. It's impossible that this could be, you know, what, what could be going on. No idea. Um, and then, of course, we saw the news like everybody else once uh, the Sabbath went out um, and we were shocked um, and, you know, frightened, I think, really, that uh, such such thing had taken place, was continued to take place because there were still terrorists in Israel at that point, and nobody knew where they were. So everybody locked themselves up in their homes. And uh, we waited for further information, which, of course, wasn't quickly forthcoming. So nobody really knew. It was complete confusion. When you heard about the level of brutality in this particular attack and how heinous these terrorists have been, how much has your faith been tested if it wasn't already tested? Um, so uh, maybe, maybe uh, because I'm a rabbi, maybe because I, I, you know, I've been through this myself, I, I, I don't see it as a test of faith. Um, a a uh, rabbi that I respected a lot in my youth um, was a Holocaust survivor, Rabbi Hugo Grin. And um, he was asked, you know, did, did the Holocaust, uh, he was in Auschwitz, and did the Holocaust shake his faith in God? He said, no, it shook my faith in mankind. He said, because the uh, evil was perpetrated by uh, a number of uh, PhD uh, uh, doctorates from Heidelberg University who attended the final solution discussions in Germany. And uh, he said, you know, God, I don't blame. He said, but mankind and you know, the sort of academic institutions in which these people trained, I, I, I can yeah, blame, blame them. And I, I think the same thing here is that I, I don't lose faith in God in this situation. I perhaps uh, question the culture which these people come from, the religion that they uh, per, you know, uh, claim to practice, uh, and the culture in which they uh, bring up their children.
Uh, and that and that's the big question I think for all of us to ask at this point. When your wife and and two of uh, two of your children were, were murdered, you you didn't call out for for vengeance. You were obviously aware that the IDF would have to investigate and respond. What's your feeling now in terms of how Israel? should be responding to this wave of horrific terror? So again, I, I look, I, I don't feel anger. And it's not something which I, I generally feel. And I don't feel anger against any of these people at all. But I, I think that the, somebody put it very nicely when and very accurately when they said that if Israel were to put down its weapons today, we would be attacked from our neighbors and we'd be slaughtered in our beds, as we have seen. If the uh, Palestinians would put down their weapons today, we would have peace. And I think that is the reality. Unfortunately, we are surrounded by uh, really a, a, a huge number of terrorists who want to see us dead. Uh, in the charter of the Gazan people, it's written uh, that they have the intention of killing every Jew, not just in Israel, but all over the world. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that is the situation we're in. Um, I think that uh, many people in Israel understood this the last 20 or 30 years. We knew that uh, the Palestinians, the Hamas and the Palestinian Authority have been training their children from the age of 10 in terror camps, uh, summer camps, where they uh, you know, tra tra train, them to be, uh, train them to be terrorists. We know that the um, textbooks that they learn from at school, which are paid for by the United Nations and uh, published by the Palestinian Authority, uh, contain uh, comprehension stories about previous terrorists, asking them how they would, you know, what they would do if they came to uh, the beach in Tel Aviv with a gun, uh, and they have to write a little sort of creative story about that. Um, and we know that uh, there's been a massive program for what they call pay for slay, which means that um, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas pay terrorist families if they've been uh, uh, neutralized after an attack uh, to the tune of maybe a million dollars per family. So there's a huge in uh, incentive, financial incentive, for these terrorists uh, to per perpetrate atrocities. It's the biggest incentive scheme for terrorists in the world, and it's right on the doorstep. And as Israel responds, you know that Hamas will use its civilians as human shields, and there will be innocent people who are killed as a consequence of military action. That is simply an inevitability. How concerned are you that there appears to be still a double standard in the reporting of Israel when you compare it to, let's say, America's operation in Afghanistan? Um, David, that's a very good question. I think that um, you know, we see uh, the hypocrisy uh, when it comes to Israel, uh, looking at the reaction of certain liberal, let's say, even left-wing groups um, around the world the day after this atrocity, going to the streets and shouting their support for Hamas with uh, often swastikas and other different uh, symbols of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, so, so there are people out there who just you know, want to see Jewish blood and uh, have you know and, and they disguise it in words that suggest that they care about the rights of the Palestinians. But of course, we know. If anyone really cared about Palestinians, there wouldn't be a Hamas, there wouldn't be a Palestinian Authority, there wouldn't have been these textbooks, there wouldn't be this training courses funded by the United Nations, uh, paid for by uh, you know Western countries uh, through the United Nations. Um, actually, um, people if people really cared about the Palestinian people, they would have actually tried to build infrastructure for them, hospitals, schools, um, businesses, factories, uh, employment. The billions of dollars have been poured into these countries, into Gaza, into the West Bank. And uh, all they've come up with is uh, terror training and terror incentives. Um, so uh, I think that yeah, that's the world we're in. Um, as far as as you, you put the killing of innocent uh, Palestinians, of course, it's it's sad. But I'm glad you used the word killing because there is a difference um, in, t in terms of morality between murder and killing. Uh, murder is uh, always wrong. And uh, that's what happened to us uh, on the 7th of October. Um, killing sometimes is a response to uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, a Holocaust that took place on the 7th of October, which really was a Holocaust. And um, 
the killing you know, occurs when when two armies or one army uh, or two armies uh, conflict with each other, um, and that is permissible actually morally uh, if if there are grounds for um, defending yourself against um, a, a large threat. It's this this argument of false equ- equivalence, and really it it comes down to intent. If your intent is to murder as many people as possible, that's very different to there being casualties when you're trying to take out a terror group and there is accidental, uh, for want of a better expression, collateral damage. Yeah, they're correct. And uh, we just discovered that the headquarters of the Hamas organization is actually uh, built underneath the main hospital in Gaza, which I think tells you everything you need to know. We also know that the Israelis asked the Palestinian people, demanded that they leave uh, and go south and we know uh, that Hamas have been stopping the people from leaving, blocking the roads because they need them to be there as a uh, civilian sort of uh, shield uh, against uh, to protect them. So uh, we can see that you know, the Hamas people don't really care at all about their own people. Uh, and we know that the leader, Hamiya, um, is actually sitting in a five-star hotel in Qatar at the moment. And he brought his son out uh, September the 18th on a flight uh, in order to, to save him from what he knew was going to be uh, a dangerous time in uh, Qatar. The other, the other you know, hypocrisy of all this is that these leaders, these, uh, these Hamas leaders, often are treated in Israeli hospitals when they have illnesses. And the same with the Palestinian Authority, the, the, the top leaders of the Palestinians, if they, if they have a serious illness, uh, will be the first ones to, to, to ask Israel to treat them and they come to get the top treatment in Israeli hospitals. So uh, these are the people who we're dealing with who um, are hypocrites, uh, they're pure evil, and uh, you know they care uh, less about their own people, really, than even about uh, killing us. I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the human rights uh, do not exist in Gaza, nor in the Palestinian Authority. Uh, they have a score of 11 on the Freedom House uh, ratings, which means that the Hamas treat their people without any human rights, um, and no one has freedom of speech, freedom of religion. How many Christians do you know of in uh, Gaza City? Uh, how many synagogues are there in, in Gaza City? You know, despite the fact that in Israel uh, we have 1.7 million Muslims living in peace and prosperity with full human rights, we have plenty of mosques, we have plenty of Muslim schools, we have plenty of uh, freedom of speech, um, but there's not one Jew living in, in Gaza and not one Jew living in Ramallah. So uh, I think that tells you everything you need to know about you know, where, where the good is and where the evil is in this particular conflict. Why do you think organisations like the BBC are still so reticent to use the word terror when describing attacks on Israelis and Jews? Okay, David, I think that, uh, you know, the media is a business and they look at their audience and, and they provide them with what their audience wants. And I think if you look at the tens of thousands of people pouring out on the streets in order to support Hamas at the moment, which of course is creating a tremendous fear amongst the Jewish community in, in London, as I understand, and in Manchester, um, then um, the BBC is you know, would like to appeal to those people as well. So therefore, in order to create what they call a balance, but in fact, just to basically to uh, fulfill their mandate of providing the information in a way that everybody wants to hear it, uh, they're prepared to tell lies and to present information incorrectly uh, in order to uh, placate um, a certain element of the population. As Israel's operation in Gaza continues, what do you think is an ideal endgame beyond the eradication of Hamas? Um, It's a very good question. I think that uh, there are possible uh, scenarios uh, that could come out of this. Um, I I think that uh, it depends to the extent that uh, we're able to eliminate uh, the terrorists and uh, to have uh, an embargo and all the uh, uh, disarmament of all the weapons. Uh, if that is done effectively, and uh, there's there's some trust uh, that you know these people will not get uh, weapons from anywhere else, and uh, there has to be a denazification process that takes place, probably funded by the United Nations, same people who uh, paid for the education of these children to become radicalized and uh, terror trained. Uh, they'll have to be exactly what happened after the Second World War: um, experts coming in to to denazify. Uh, the, the the mindset of these children so that they can actually grow up and become productive and normal human beings. But assuming that all that is done, uh, I think there are different models. There, there's one model which would suggest breaking uh, Gaza up into 10 uh, autonomous uh, towns, village, uh, cities perhaps, 200,000 people, let's say, in each one, 
uh, surrounded by um, sovereign Israel. So that would allow the Israeli army to be present with, uh, you know, with, with military bases, maybe even Jewish uh, towns between them in order to make a more mixed sort of society. I'd like to see at some point the Gazan people having the, the right to freely enter Israel and to work uh, in, in across the whole of Israel. But I think that you know, whilst that was something that was on the table, I think, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, and in fact, more and more Gazans were being uh, invited to come and work in Israel and were starting to, to, to come into Israel. I think that what uh, Hamas has achieved in you know, 24 hours has been to destroy a lot of the hopes and 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 potential for uh, two million uh, Gazan people. So they have you know really wrecked the lives for the Gazan people for the foreseeable future. But I do believe there will become a time when um, they'll be able to live in autonomous uh, cities, perhaps you know, like an Emirates type structure, with a seat in the United Nations, with a president, um, and the ability to come uh, out freely, uh, like people in Monaco work in France, like people in. Vatican work in in Italy um, and just you know uh, work freely within uh, Israel. How much harder is that eventuality when you have countries like Iran working behind the curtain to stir up trouble? Um, I think you're you're right. Um, it's um, it is a challenge. Um, however, I think that um, you know israel and the world the western nations are also to blame because uh the ability for 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 the gazans to receive the money from iran and to spend it on weapons which they had to import through borders right which is humanitarian so-called humanitarian aid which was cement which was used primarily to create uh, terror tunnels uh, and metal which was used primarily you know to to make uh, some weapons and, and and somehow they managed to smuggle weapons in from egypt or goodness knows where um, I, th- I think that um, you know, we, we're all to blame for allowing that to happen. So you know, even if there is the money and the support from Iran, I think now if there's a closer eye on uh, making sure that uh, weapons uh, don't come into uh, Gaza, we hopefully can you know, pr- uh, protect ourselves much better going forward. So how confident are you that further down the road that there is a chance for genuine peace? I'm certain that there's a chance for genuine peace, and it really depends on the complete disarmament of the Palestinian people, not just in Gaza, but also in the Palestinian Authority, um, and a new structure, which is probably not a two-state uh, solution, probably, as I say, more uh, fragmented, uh, but a state with an identity, with a flag, with its own culture, uh, but perhaps not the ability to wage war uh, on us in the way that it has been by being contiguous and therefore uh, for terrorists to be able to hide behind human shields in quite the way that they've been able to up to now. I'm speaking to a lot of, um, a, a lot of youth in uh, Israel uh, and abroad, and I'm saying to them you know, that the trick or the, the important thing now is for people to be involved in the, in the war effort in whichever way they can. There are many charities in Israel that are desperately in need of uh, funding. For example, one of the charities that uh, funded, which helped my kids uh, through the last six months, providing them with uh, um, some summer camp uh, activities and uh, support, um, told me that the number of children orphaned by terror in Israel doubled on uh, the 7th of October. The number in Israel uh, of orphans, uh, orphans from terror doubled in one day. I mean, it's the same number that we had over the last 30 or 40 years uh, is equal to what happened in one day. Uh, and that means that the ability for those charities to uh, support the families is, is is very much stretched. In fact, the impossible for them to support them. Uh, soldiers, uh, charities, I believe it a lot, a lot of uh, soldiers have gone to battle without the correct equipment, without bulletproof vests, without helmets, because uh, for whatever reason, Israel wasn't prepared for such a large call-up. And there are about, uh, I think, 400,000 reserves that, are, that have gone out, including many of my neighbors and their sons, um, you know, it, it, it's frightening because I already went to one funeral of a neighbor's son uh, this week, and uh, God forbid, you know, this will continue for a number uh, of weeks. Uh, one can only uh, expect that there will be more. And everyone in Israel knows people who have been either killed in on the seventh of October or or uh, who are fighting on the front. And um, this is a national level tragedy. I mean, it's, it's a holocaust. Uh, and uh, we, we, nobody in Israel expected that we would see in our lifetimes um, what our grandparents went through uh, 80 years ago. And yet we're sitting here 
you know, we've been saying never again for 80 years and it just happened. So I think the desire on the behalf of the Jewish people and the Israeli people to make sure this really never happens again is now absolute. And uh, I hope that uh, the Israeli army takes this to uh, completion and ensures that uh, we have an outcome where this could never happen again.